Have you ever started a collection, and it could be really a collection of anything, it doesn't necessarily have to be retro video games, but whatever it is, when you're out looking for items for that said collection, and every now and then you see one particular item, but for whatever reason, you just keep passing it up. Maybe there was some other item that you wanted more, maybe it was just too expensive at the time, or maybe your hands were just full with the customary stainless steel mug of Wild Bill's root beer from the convention. Who's to say? That is the case for me with today's game. Dino Land, which was released by Renovation in the United States in November of 1991, just a few months after it had first appeared in Japan. Dino Land, for whatever reason, probably not the Wild Bill's root beer reason, was just one of those games with a cover that stood out amongst other Genesis releases that I just had never managed to add to the collection. That was until I finally got around to picking it up from a vendor at this year's Midwest Gaming Classic last month, and I thought, rather than just having it sit on the shelf until God knows when, let's go ahead and get it into the schedule sooner rather than later, and maybe break up some of these less interesting sports game reviews. Now, Time Killers, on the other hand, which I also picked up at the show this year, that one can stay on the shelf for a while. I'm not exactly in any rush to review a fighting game that's going to end up somewhere between Rise of the Robots and Shaq Fu. However, I should probably pause for a second because I'm sure that there's some of you out there that don't know me and just randomly got dropped here due to searching for the very real life-size dinosaurs featured in Pee-wee's Big Adventure, located in Cabazon, California. Come to think of it, I should probably have that down as a bucket list item. Uh, anyway, hi, my name is Dave, and welcome to Zalagamoto, the channel where, rather than serve as some sort of atlas of filming locations from one of the greatest movies of the 1980s, I'm actually instead out to collect and review the nearly 1,280 titles released in the English language for the Sega Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega or Mega CD as the case may be, and finally the 32X. Basically, if I can plug it into a Genesis, either by itself or with some sort of add-on, and be able to read what's up on the screen, I'm trying to get a copy of it and review it for posterity, with both looks at that original packaging and gameplay captured from original hardware, whenever possible. So, if Dino Land the game isn't based on some sort of amusement facility that houses dinosaurs, a, perhaps a Jurassic Park, if you will, although that sounds silly, I mean, who would name something like that? Anyway, then what is Dino Land? Well, would you believe it's a video pinball game? Well, I hope you would, because that's exactly what it is. Dino Land, at least according to the rear cover of the game, is the story of, and I'm not making this up, as you'll see in a minute, main character Dino Buns and his adventure to rescue the lovely Michelle from the various enemies that are plaguing Dino Land. And yes, you heard me correctly, the main character's name is Dino Buns. I'm not sure if this is some sort of weird translation thing, as this is very much a Japanese title, as Renovation and Wolf Team are known for, but Dino Buns? I mean, Michelle at least makes sense, as it's clearly a play on Michelle. You know what, I should probably just stop thinking about it and play the game. So let's do that. But first, our customary look at this very bright green package. Okay, and this is my copy of Dino Land. And being something that I picked up at a convention and not just happened to stumble upon in the wild or on eBay, that meant that I had my pick of quality, and this copy is in fantastic shape. The hang tab has been removed from the top of the case, but other than that, it's in near perfect condition. The outer cover doesn't have any scratches, nicks, or tears to the clear plastic, and the inner cover is flawless as well, looking exactly like it would have looked on a store shelf around Christmas of 1991, with no edge wear, sun bleaching, or water damage. This is definitely a copy that I would consider a keeper, as it doesn't get much better, but... If you get through this review and decide that you want one for yourself, complete copies are trending at around 40 bucks right now. Like most of the renovation releases on the console, we've got a striking front cover here. Rather than the more traditional Sega first party releases at the time with the black cross hatching and inset, renovation would go with a bright colored background and then colorful art in the middle, and the result here is especially eye-catching. 
I love this cover. Between the bright green and the art clearly inspired from the game, this is definitely something that's going to stand out on the shelf. One minor point also, as far as the title goes, it's somewhat confusing because the game seems to be referred to as both Dino Land and was one word, and then Dino Land as two words. But if you look closely at the title, you can see a tiny break between the Dino and the Land, seemingly signifying that the two word version is the correct version of the title. Dino Land didn't make it to the UK, although according to Sega Retro, Ubisoft apparently thought about it for a second. I'm not sure if Ubisoft thinking about and then not releasing the game is better or worse than removing content from current games, like the Danny Trejo missions from Far Cry 6, but I suppose Ubisoft has at least been consistent with its questionable decisions for the past 35 years. Sorry, I, I just started playing Far Cry 6 last month, and this highly annoys me, but I'll move on. Instead of that European release, of course the game debuted in Japan about three months before the US release with this awesome wraparound art that was also used on the Sharp X68000 version of the game, but as good as that is, I kind of think I still have to give the win to the US version here. But I'll admit that that's a completely subjective opinion, and I certainly would not argue if you prefer the Japanese cover. Something about those wraparound covers is just always cool to look at. Flipping over the back, and there's a nice layout with four decent quality screenshots, but on opposing corners, which balances things out nicely. The screenshots are an interesting assortment, but they appear to come from a pre-release version of the game, because the brown areas look similar to the land level of the game, but they don't quite line up with the finished product. The flavor text is solid, and doesn't have any issues with English specifically, but of course in that last section, the whole Dino Land vs. Dino Land confusion gets picked up, with the game being referred to as the one word version twice. Eh, nothing's perfect. Opening up the case, and the manual is so close to pristine, just like the outside. It's a solid manual, but you can tell that with the simplicity of the game, they were struggling to fill space, so you get just some random art in the middle, and then discussions of theories of what happened to the dinosaurs, and details about the dinosaurs that actually are featured in each of the three levels. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this game is more educational than the Berenstain Bears game last, last week. At least the manual, anyway. Only one problem is, if you look closely at the control section, they left out the part about what the C button does. Oops. Well, that's the attention-getting package. Let's get into Dinoland and see if we can rescue Michelle. If you're not aware, I'm a pretty big fan of pinball games both the physical real-world variety and the virtual one. So getting to play one as part of doing reviews on Zalagamoto is always a treat. Well, I say that, but I also haven't gotten around to the Genesis and Master System versions of Sonic Spinball. So maybe it's not always going to be fun times, as my memories of that game aren't exactly the fondest. Having said that though, with Dino Land being a completely new experience for me this week, I was definitely curious as to what renovation might have brought to the table here, especially since their catalog is well known for quality releases, regardless of genre, as we saw directly in Jennifer Capriati Tennis back in episode 223 last year. I went over a bit of the setup to Dino Land in the intro, but just to lay things out, you play as main character Dino Buns. And no, I'm not going to make jokes about that name, it basically writes its own. Anyway, Dino Buns apparently has a girlfriend named Michelle, and wouldn't you know it, there's some evil dinosaurs that have kidnapped Michelle, and it's up to Dino Buns to fight off those other dinosaurs and get Michelle back. How can Dino Buns, and yes, it is pretty difficult to keep saying that name with a straight face, thank you, defeat those other dinosaurs and come to the rescue? Well, apparently he's really good at rolling himself into a ball and then being launched into them as a projectile, and thus a video pinball game is born. Making its debut in Japan in August of 1991, I'm pretty certain that this is the first attempt at a video pinball game on the Mega Draft platform, beating Technosoft's port of Devil's Crush to the Japanese market by a few months. 
However, if I'm wrong about that and there's some other Japanese exclusive Mega Drive release for a video pinball title that I'm not aware of that came first, definitely let me know in the comments down below. The reason why I bring up when Dino Land came out is to frame the review a bit, because you have to remember what was going on with the Genesis at the time, and comparing it directly to some of the other pinball titles that came later, like say Crew Ball or Dragon's Revenge, probably isn't fair. So when we're talking about Dino Land, remember that it was still relatively early for developers on the Genesis, and that the game was only 4 megabits so all of the graphics and sound had to be squeezed down into a relatively small cartridge. What does that 4 megabits get you? Well, Dino Land is an adventure through three different areas in, well, Dino Land, that consist of a land level, a sky level, and a water level. Each level forms a pretty standard looking pinball table that is taller than it is wide, with an upper room and a lower room connected in the middle. Each room has different targets to hit, with some being traditional pinball elements like bumpers and floor targets, and then some being enemy dinosaurs that just happen to be lined up in a row like targets, with each needing to be taken out to trigger some sort of element in the stage. If you've played any kind of real pinball in real life, it will seem very familiar to you, just with a cute anime dinosaur coat of paint thrown on top of it, not unlike what Hudson Soft did with the Bonk series of games. The goal of each level is to make it to the boss area, which is done by hitting a specific set of targets. Once that area is opened up, it's then time to take out the boss by hitting them enough times, but you have to watch out for Michel being taken away by the ball eater while you're busy with the boss, which means that things can get pretty hectic fairly quickly. Basically, you have to balance out trying to attack the boss in standard pinball mode while also being ready to break out of pinball mode and walk over to smack the ball eater that's trying to get away with Michelle. Of course, this is all being done while you're trying to avoid getting sent out of the boss room through the flippers, because if that happens, not only do you have to start the boss fight all over, but you also have to reopen the boss room from scratch in that table's main area. In theory, I don't think the idea behind the boss rooms is a bad idea, nor the concept of having three different levels that you need to beat. However, I do have some issues with how it's implemented. One problem is that not only is it not explained anywhere how you need to take on the bosses, once you actually figure out what you're supposed to be doing, it can still be a bit tough, and then having to start all over again to open up the boss room gets somewhat boring, as you're essentially just doing the same thing over and over again. This issue with the game not being explained well also extends into how you actually get to the water level and the sky level. So let me guess, you probably thought that when you beat the boss to the land level, you would move on to the water level or the sky level in some sort of order, right? Heh, <laughs> wrong. Actually, if you beat the boss to the land level, you simply start back in the land level again, just one million points richer. So, how do you actually get to those other two levels? Well, this was something like the strategy of how you actually beat the bosses that I had to go to the internet to find out. And here's where I'm going to complain a bit about the manual. If you watch the physical section of the video, you probably noticed that I was a bit confused because the manual seemed to be padded with information that, while it was technically dinosaur related, didn't actually have anything to do with how to play the game which is kind of a problem seeing as how the express purpose of a manual is to explain that sort of thing. What would have really been helpful would have been just even a brief section of hints and tips that would give you some clue as to what you're supposed to be doing in both the boss fights and level progression. It turns out that apparently there's two possible ways to get to the water and sky levels. One, you can technically leave it up to chance and try your luck with the slot machine in the upper left hand corner of the land level. And if you happen to get three of the right icon, you'll get teleported to the level that goes along with it. This is something that I never actually had happen in my three hours of playing the game, so I definitely would not rely on it if you're actually trying to beat it. The other way to get to one of those levels is to either turn all of the lights to the upper right hand corner of the land level, either red or blue, and then defeat a wave of new creatures in the lower portion of the level. If you do that, water or sky will appear at the bottom of the level, 
and then you just let Dino Buns drain to teleport to that level. It's kludgy at best, and I think I definitely would have preferred a much more straightforward approach to level progression. Because the way that it works out, if you drain from the water or sky levels, you end up back in the land level and have to start all over again. I suppose at least once I learned what on earth I was supposed to be doing and had a specific goal, it kind of made sense. But leaving this to just be incredibly cryptic and not have any kind of explanation as to what was going on is not great and causes way more frustration than should be present in a pinball game about cute dinosaurs. As far as the actual pinball action goes in the game, it's not bad, especially for the first pinball game on the console. There are some places where the physics don't seem quite right and a few areas where the ball can get stuck or angles that just don't seem quite right, but nothing that I really think draws away from the game. And then having the left flipper on the D-pad and the right flipper on the C button feels very nice. And I do like how the game has allowances for creating ball stops so that you can avoid drains, assuming that you hit the necessary targets in the level, that is. When researching the game, I did see some people online complain about the speed of things, but ultimately, I don't think that's an issue, and the game feels pinball-esque enough to me to where I'm sure there's room for improvement, but I don't think the actual action specifically needed any tweaks, as it's quite playable as is, and feels like pinball. There's two things about the game that I'm somewhat confused by, and just like the other issues that I previously mentioned, they're not spelled out specifically in the manual. First, the game has three difficulty levels, referred to in the manual as Normal, Hard, and Dangerous. However, when you actually go into the options menu, they are instead listed as Big Inner, yes, Big Inner, I'm assuming a mistranslated version of Beginner, Intermediate, and Expert. Seriously, they could spell Intermediate but not Beginner? Anyway, the whole point is, I'm not exactly sure what's different between the three. I did play a few rounds in Expert, and honestly, the game seemed exactly the same, with perhaps the ball maybe moving slightly faster? Perhaps the bosses take more hits, or maybe you have to take out more waves of enemies to open the sky and water levels, but who knows? Either way, I don't really see a reason to play in any of the harder difficulty levels. But it would have been nice to know what the differences were. The second thing I'm confused by is how to beat the game. Now, I think the way that you beat the game is to defeat the bosses in each level at least one time, and then when you lose all your lives, the end sequence will play. I, I think that's how it works anyway, but again, that's not spelled out anywhere in the manual. What is mentioned in the manual is that there's a continue option, which appears to be infinite in nature. However, again, it's not clear what continuing does. You keep your score from your previous game, that much is obvious. But do you keep your progress of beating the bosses? If so, then I think it's a great thing that the continue function was programmed into the game, but again, without knowing for sure, it's a bit frustrating. Despite any issues that I might have with the gameplay or just the cryptic nature of the game in general, one thing that I cannot complain about is the graphics and sound. For a 4 megabit cartridge, the game looks and sounds fantastic. It reminds me a bit of Decap Attack, one of the best games that I've reviewed so far on the channel, and that one also weighs in at only 4 megabits. Dino Land is a very colorful title, especially once you get away from the land level and then get into the water and sky levels. Along with a great use of the color palette, there's some really nice special effects that are used in those two levels that were pretty uncommon at the time. Yeah, and it may just be a pinball game, but I think it's one that clearly some effort was went into, with the art that's used on the sprites and the table targets all looking great and very well drawn. One of the ways that I know a game has good sound is when immediately on boot up, I hear the first startup theme and mentally give it a sort of Keanu level whoa, which is what happened with Dino Land. Any theme that gets my subwoofer activity going is going to get my attention, but it's not just a nice use of bass, it's also got some great instrumentation. Some of the music gives, and I don't think this is hyperbole, a definitely Sonic the Hedgehog vibe, like you could drop it into one of the levels in Sonic and no one would bat an eyelash. 
There's places where maybe only having 4 megabits hurt some of the synths, and they could have possibly used some more space to have cleaner samples, especially with the sound effects. But I was impressed, and in a true test of a game like this, the music and sound effects never got old or annoying, even though I ended up spending up most of my time in the same level with the same music track and effects. Diamond Land is a game that I think might be a bit controversial to rate. On the one hand, it's got all of those issues that I laid out, and three relatively simple pinball tables doesn't exactly make for a whole lot of gameplay. However, the release date has to matter, and the fact that it's literally the first pinball game made for the Genesis means something as well, because Wolf Team was the first developer to even attempt a video pinball game on the console. And as we saw from reviewing Virtual Pinball back in episode 179, there's a lot of things that can go sideways in these types of games. As frustrating as it is to try to figure out Dino Land without the aid of the internet, once I understood what the developers were going for, the game opened up a bit. As a result of this, I'm going to give Dino Land three stars. It's a deeply flawed title, there's no doubt about it, but for a mid to late 1991 release, Dino Land manages to pack in some great special effects, sound, and gameplay into a tiny package, and video pinball fans should definitely give it a look. Okay, and that is it for Dino Land for the Genesis. So far, Renovation is two for two in the quality title department, and I'm definitely looking forward to the next time that I get to put one of their games on the schedule. Hopefully, next time, the game won't be a cryptic mess that depends on the player to simply dump hours and hours into figuring out the game's secrets because the publisher couldn't figure out what information to put in the manual. You know, come to think of it, Jennifer Capriati Tennis did have that hidden option screen that really needed to not be hidden, seeing as how it had all the difficulty settings in it, so maybe that's just going to be a thing that they're known for, but... You know, I've got my fingers crossed that the next time we cross paths, I don't need the grand oracle that is the internet to explain how to properly play the game. Next time on Zalagamoto, it is another open spot in the schedule, so I get to pick my poison for that next review. And I think I will actually choose poison this time around, because the last three games that I've had on the schedule have all been above average three-star titles, and I simply can't let that stand. Things are getting too good around here. It's time to review something with a terrible reputation that's probably going to chase away all of the new viewers that I've picked up for the last month. This needs to be a bad game on steroids, much like the game's namesake who has managed to never get voted into the Hall of Fame because of it. Probably shouldn't tempt fate like that, and yes, all of you out there are free to mock me when this next review goes poorly. Well, that's it for Zalagamoto episode 237. If you liked what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you are so inclined, as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun, and be excellent to each other. Later!